design philosophy came from sales and marketing, which is don't ruin our sales. <laughs> okay. Well, that's uh, always a, yeah. a, 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 an uh, initiative that but, sales puts forth. But that meant, more importantly, don't ruin our sales for all our other product. The Planescape setting was released in 1994 and was created by David Zeb Cook. The Manual to the Planes already existed having been published in 1987 and Deities and Demigods also touched on similar topics. However, that manual was more of a guide on the individual planes that you could potentially use in your already established campaign. Planescape was instead an opportunity to explore the planes in a different manner, to have an entire campaign set there which melded the planes with adventure, gods, philosophies, and magic. Planescape offered new details on the inner planes of air, earth, fire, and water, and the para-elemental and quasi-elemental planes, as well as the positive and negative material planes. Planescape also explored the unique paths that allow adventurers to traverse between the planes. These paths included the River Oceanus and Styx, Tree Yggdrasil, and Mount Olympus. However, two of the most famous and recognisable aspects that Planescape introduced was the City of Sigil and the Lady of Pain. The Blood War was also explored extensively even though that had technically been introduced in Monstrous Compendium Outer Plains 1991. One of Cook's goals when designing the Planescape setting was to make the adventure accessible to single leveled characters. It didn't need to be such a dangerous place where only high level parties could end up. And according to this White Wolf magazine from 1994, the setting had more of a focus on role-playing and thinking, not moving and hacking. And whilst the Manual of the Planes was a great supplement, there was apparently a change in trend where people wanted less complex and easier role-playing games. Challenge your imagination to come alive and to battle with the creatures of Dungeons and Dragons. Grapple against the forces of evil as a Marvel comic superhero. Hunt adventure and glory as Indiana Jones. The all-new role-playing games of TSR and Dungeons and Dragons. Unleash the power of your imagination. This was something Cook could offer while still giving a lore-rich and fascinating setting. According to Scott Haring, over at Steve Jackson Games in August 1994, David Cook wanted to create a setting that was truly for adults, in the sense that the setting and the games you might play within it could challenge your ideas about life, the universe, and everything. In an article called Mutating the Planes, written by David Cook himself, he says the following, It shouldn't have been a problem. It just had to be a complete campaign world, not just a place to visit survivable by low-level characters, as compatible as possible with the old Manual of the Planes, filled with a feeling of vastness without overwhelming the referee, distinct from all other TSR campaigns, free of the words demon and devil, and explainable to marketing in 25 words or less. Like I said, no problem. The reason the setting was to be free of words like demon and devil was because of things like this. Dungeons and Dragons. Some claim it's a simple, harmless game. Yet suicides, murders, and robberies have been linked to this game. Yes, the D&D Satanic Panic was largely an event that happened in the 1980s, but it was certainly still present in the 90s, reeling from the ridiculous accusations that the previous decade had thrown at the role-playing game and TSR. The original owners of the D&D franchise before Wizards of the Coast were still trying to make sure the image of D&D wasn't going to be ruined by a few fanatical loons of the age. If they had to give some small concessions in the form of renaming demons and devils, and so be it. Fortunately, modern day studies have shown no link between people who play Dungeons and Dragons or any type of role-playing game and violence. In fact, it has been shown to largely help people's mental health. Much of the paranoia that once surrounded D&D has moved on to video games, which is often scapegoated as a precursor to violent behaviour instead of poor and ignored mental health. In order to inspire him to create the setting of Planescape, Cook used several books and films. The three books that he used were called The Dictionary of the Khazars, Einstein's Dreams, and The Narrow Road to the Deep North, 
All of these were very different in terms of subject matter, as the Dictionary of the Khazars was written by a Serbian author called Milorad Pavic, who writes about the Khazar royalty converting to Judaism in the last decades of the 8th century. Although this might seem like a historical work, the characters and events described are fictional. I suppose you may wonder why this was used as inspiration. Well, I certainly haven't read the book, but in an archived New York Times article which reviewed it, it has the following to say. It is, in a sense, the tension between future time, which, with its promise of death and its intransigent sequence of days and nights, bears down upon us remorselessly, and time past, which, if it can be said to exist at all, exists only in cranial space, in that sprawling, multi-level and often chaotic house of our memory. This is apparently explaining the paradoxical narrative of the book, and I have to admit I'm not entirely sure what it's talking about, so it potentially fits the confusing nature to the planes in relation to the material world. The second book that was used for inspiration is called Einstein's Dreams, and again follows the theme of time, as the plot fictionalizes Albert Einstein and his dreams that he has when he was coming up with his theory of relativity. Finally, the third book, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, is a Japanese poem written in the 17th century by Matsuo Basho, who made a dangerous journey through the Edo Japan of the late 17th century. It starts off as follows. The days and months are travellers of eternity, just like the years that come and go. For those who pass their lives afloat on boats, or face old age leading horses tight by the bridle, their journeying is life, their journeying is home, and many are the men of old who met their end upon the road. Obviously translations differ from each English translation as the original is written in Old Japanese, but I'm sure you can get the idea of how an epic journey could be relevant to Cook's work on Planescape. The narrow road to the deep north, or as it is known in Japanese, Oku no Hoshimichi, is considered one of the most famous and important texts in Japanese history. The films that Cook used were entitled The Naked Lunch and Wolf Devil Woman. The Naked Lunch is an American film about a man who develops an addiction to the substance he used to kill bugs, but he accidentally kills his wife and becomes involved in a secret government plot being orchestrated by giant bugs in a port town in North Africa. And believe it or not, it is actually based on a 1959 novel with the same name. Wolf Devil Woman is a 1982 Taiwanese horror film and follows the story of a wolf-like woman that grows up in the snowy wilderness of the Cold Ice Peak. Cook says the following regarding these films. For some reason, all this started affecting my brain. I can't imagine why. Eventually, David Cook came up with a theme for Planescape, and it largely revolved around strangeness. He wanted to capture the image of students arguing philosophy in a bar, lots of ideas flying around. This image would lead to the birth of Sigil, which would act as a crossroads and the chance to sit with deadly enemies at the same table. It became the campaign center and through which everyone could access the planes. This led to Cook's creations of the factions, which includes groups like the Doomguard and the Fated. According to Scott Herring, David Cook described the factions in only three words, as philosophers with clubs. In the actual Planescape setting book, we can see a more detailed rundown of the matter. Factions are a bit like character kits, but unlike those, factions don't care what race or class a character is. The only thing that matters is alignment and even then it sometimes doesn't matter. Factions provide a basher with a way to understand the planes. It's not the same as alignment, but it can be close. Also, unlike kits, factions are actually organizations with benefits and restrictions. Every faction has a leader known as the Factol, whose position is purely dependent upon dedication to the philosophy, not upon level or class. Some factions are more organized than others, and at least one, the Indeps, isn't really a faction at all. Every planar player character must start with a faction, and once a faction is chosen, the cutter is pretty much stuck with it, so he or she should choose carefully. Of course, if you were to have every danger in the known multiverse able to wander into Sigil, then you needed something to regulate it. The city was supposed to be strange, but it wasn't supposed to be total carnage. This is where the Lady of Pain came in. In the Planescape setting book, she is described as follows. The Lady of Pain, just by being there, makes all things possible. She is the one who gets the credit for several effects that make Sigil and the entire Planescape campaign setting what it is. She's the one who makes Sigil safe for characters of all experience levels. She's the one who blocks the powers from Sigil. 
She's the one whose influence prevents gate spells from working and shields Sigil from the astral plane. She's the one who creates the maze that traps Sigil's would-be conquerors. Basically, she can be used by a DM to justify why a city can be filled with so many dangerous creatures and yet a level 1 party could fit in. A useful tool for a dungeon master, but alongside that, she's also a fascinating character, one that Cook loved so much that she became the entire logo for the Planescape setting. In the Planescape setting book, we can see lots of interesting artwork, which I have to say isn't my favourite style, but it is recognisable and unique. The initial artwork was done by a man called Dana Knutson, and David Cook describes the relationship as one where he babbled and Dana drew anything that he wanted. Cook initially wanted art that was inspired by the gloomy prisons drawn by Giovanni Battista Piranesi and Brode's illustrations. Dana Knutson did the concept artwork for all of Cook's ideas, but it was actually Tony Di Terlizzi that drew the art based on Dana's concepts that we associate with the Planescape setting. So together, David Cook, Dana Knutson, and Tony Di Terlizzi crafted a strange and hauntingly beautiful campaign setting, with Cook at the helm putting pen to paper and crafting the lore of the setting, whilst Knutson made Cook's ideas come to life through his art. However, was the setting strange enough? Not according to Cook, who stated that due to time, pressure, and the need for it to be playable, he could not go all out on some of the things that he wanted to do. Nevertheless, the setting that he created was detailed and fascinating, but we will explore the actual details of that in part 2. Thanks for watching guys, if you enjoyed this video then do please give me a like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!